want to welcome everybody here today. Uh, good morning. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, many of you, I, I, some of you, I guess, I have not seen yet, so I want to wish everyone a Happy New Year. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues uh, for being here this morning uh, to really talk about the Republican conference's agenda, the Republican conference's priority, but I think more importantly, priorities for millions of New Yorkers. These are not just the priorities of the 21 people here today. They're not just the priorities of, of Albany insiders. These are the priorities of our constituents. These are the priorities of New Yorkers from all political backgrounds, all ethnic backgrounds, all stripes. This is what we're hearing from people across this state. And I don't believe the items we're going to talk about today are being addressed by the Democratic majority, by the Democratic governor. I don't believe that there's a willingness in some cases to address these issues. And certainly, we have not seen answers thus far, either in the state of the state or the budget. I'm going to let my colleagues drill down on some of these specifics, but I did want to hit on, um, in light of the, the budget address that came out yesterday, there was a theme that I, I couldn't help but notice. And it was a theme about, you know, really a transfer of resources. And of course, that means a transfer of power. Um, when you looked at some of the things that was highlighted, so let's talk about the migrant crisis, which has been roiling the state for well over a year. It is a crisis that has been created by policies, Democrat policies. In fact, I would argue by Democrat cornerstones. Many of my colleagues for many years talked about sanctuary city policy, sanctuary state policy as a cornerstone of their philosophy. And it was very convenient to talk about it when there really wasn't a lot of consequences to it. But now we see what the consequence of that is. Of open borders and sanctuary city policies, it has led directly to a crisis of illegal migrants in the city of New York and in the state of New York. Now, initially we were told, we were initially told that this would be a New York City issue and New York City would pay for it. Other places around New York State, taxpayers, counties, would not be on the hook. That was a lie. We now know that's a lie because the governor is asking for $2.4 billion on top of the $1.9 billion in state resources. Over $4 billion, if she gets her way, will end up going to the city of New York to tackle a migrant crisis. So the notion that New Yorkers outside of the city aren't going to be on the hook for this is false. I have school districts, and I guarantee my colleagues do, school districts that took migrants into their classroom. They were told there'd be no cost borne by the district. It would come out of this largesse. That's not true. I have two school districts that have only received 50 percent of the funding necessary to educate the illegal migrants in their school systems. And that's just in two school districts in western New York. So that was also false. And now, of course, we know the mayor of New York is calling for cuts, cuts to services like police and other services that protect legal, law-abiding, tax-paying, I would argue the highest tax-paying people in the country in New York City. We're going to cut those services so that we can allocate more services to this migrant crisis. And of course, even further, they're going to ask the state now, or the state's committing, uh, the governor's committing, $2.4 billion. There is a point where you have to ask yourself, what are we, what are we actually doing here? Who are we serving? What is the end game? Where does the migrant crisis end? It was $1.9 billion last year. It's $2.4 billion this year. Will it be over $3 billion next year? Because unless we address the root cause of why we're here, it will continue. And we're not doing that. So you're seeing money from across the state going specifically to a New York City created issue. The governor talked about five prison closures. And I know there's, you know, certainly my colleagues across the aisle look at, they don't think anyone should be in prison. So no doubt, closing prisons is always going to seem like a good idea to them. 
Uh, and if they could close them all, I'm sure they would. But the fact of the matter is those five prison closures, which were not identified, of course, um, they will absolutely be upstate and they will absolutely be in the districts represented by somebody standing on this staircase. So there's no impact. And the notion, and I want to speak to this, that the idea that prisons were built as a, as a jobs program for poor upstate communities is such a lie and a notion that has been perpetuated by people on the far left um, that it has, to be, it has to be answered here. That's, not, that's simply not true. Prisons were built because we needed prisons, because people break the law and need to go to jail. That's why prisons are there. And by shrinking prisons, you're going to, or closing them, you're going to move those, those inmates to other prisons and cause straining on those resources and those prisons, overcrowding, and other issues that our corrections officers are already dealing with today. But what's more interesting to me is, is the idea that when, I love when my colleagues across the aisle talk about efficiency and streamlining. The only time they talk about it is when it comes to the criminal justice system. They don't care at all about saving money, streamlining, efficiencies, except in this one area. So while we are all for streamlining and efficiencies, and I'm always happy to have that conversation, and I think as elected leaders we need to have that conversation, it just strikes me as a little bit um, in disingenuous when it's only on this issue and it's never on any other issue. We've got to close prisons to save $77 million, but we're going to spend $2.3 billion on the migrant crisis. Just to give you an idea of your priorities um, right now facing the leadership in New York. We talked about the infrastructure spending. The MTA, record, record uh, spending, record investment from the state of New York. Upstate roads and bridges, not so much. Now this has been going on for a long time, but that gap is widening even further. And then the education piece that the governor talked about, I promise you this, rhetoric aside, when the numbers come out, and I think the numbers came out last night, and you look at the school runs, you will see that suburban and rural districts are going to have less money coming in, and the cities will have the same or more. So all of these things are the same, it's the same issue at hand. It's a taking away of resources and influence in rural, suburban parts of New York, sometimes, very often represented by Republicans, and driving that investment into the cities. And it's ironic to me that a Western New York governor is the one doing it. This isn't coming from the legislature. The reason I highlight that is because the legislature, I believe, might make it even worse. If you look at who runs both houses of the legislature. So, you know, I had hoped that the, that the governor, Governor Hochul, a Democrat, being from upstate, being from western New York, having been in local government, would have at least fought harder for those principles, would have fought harder because knowing that she has to be the counterweight for rural and suburban areas, that she has to be the counterweight to the Democratic leadership from downstate. And instead, she's kowtowing to it. And that is really problematic for our conference. It's problematic for our constituents. And we're going to do our best to highlight those challenges and highlight where this budget falls short and highlight where her state of, sta where her state, of the state vision falls short and make sure that the issues facing our constituents and a lot of my colleagues' constituents uh, are heard and we're going to do our best to try to address those. You're going to hear about affordability. My colleagues answer to affordability and they talk about affordability. We agree that affordability is an issue. Their answer is obviously more spending. If that was the solution to affordability, we would absolutely be the most affordable state in the union because we spend $230 billion. But clearly that's not working because New Yorkers' money is going less. They're getting less for it. They're fleeing the state. 
because it's too expensive to live here. In fact, our colleagues across the aisle, when they voted a pay raise, they said New York's an expensive uh, place to live. Senator Liz Kruger, those were her exact words. She apparently fails to understand that it's expensive in part because of the things we do here or fail to do here sometimes. This conference has stood with our uh, men and women in law enforcement for many years. We will continue to. But you're not just standing with members of law enforcement. You're standing with the people they are protecting and serving. That's what it's about. It's not about standing with a, a particular police officer or a sheriff. It's about standing with the people that they are duty bound to protect. And our colleagues continue to stick their heads in the sand when it comes to crime, whether it be car thefts, retail theft. I mean, for God's sakes, the governor of New York in the state of the state came up with an idea of a task force on retail theft. Retail theft, in part, is what it is today because of the policies passed by the Democratic-controlled Senate and Assembly and signed by two Democratic governors. That's why retail theft is where it is. They have created the conditions that retail theft has spiked. And now their answer to that is a task force. My colleagues in the Senate and the Assembly have shown no will, no political will, to address crime, to address bail, to address discovery, to address less is more. They're not willing to do it. In fact, they want to continue pushing new pro-criminal policies. So this task force, whatever it comes up with, unless the Senate and the Assembly are willing to do something about it, it will mean nothing. This task force will produce paper and not results. The answer to retail theft isn't locking up the toothpaste and baby formula. It's locking up the people who are stealing these goods. But our, my colleagues have shown they do not have the political will or the desire to do that. And so New Yorkers are going to have to show that desire to send them packing when the time comes. They have to send the message. That's the only thing that's going to work on this issue, in my opinion. <clears throat> um, lastly, before I turn over to our deputy, my, my deputy leader, our floor leader, Senator Lanza, um, I do want to touch on anti-Semitism and, and, and what we've seen over the... I spent uh, about 10 days in Israel in August. And I was at one of the kibbutzes that was attacked on October 7th. I was at the Gaza border. Um, I was at many of the other borders. I was up in the Lebanese border. I was at the Syrian border. It was a, a, a trip of a lifetime, to be very honest with you. But it also hits very close to home to think that there were people that I spoke to that I met, and I don't know if they're alive today. Senator Ashby was with me as well. I don't know how they're doing today. We had, uh, we had dinner with a family whose son was in the IDF. I don't know where he is today. But I do know this. I do know that the largest population of Jews outside of Israel is here in the state of New York. I do know that we have a task force led by Senator Martins on anti-Semitism that we started a year ago because you could see you could see there was a change, there was a shift. And, and I don't want to lose sight of the significance of anti-Semitism and the real problem in the history, but this is a larger shift. When you're seeing what's happening on our college campuses, it's a larger shift. It, it, it goes beyond just anti-Semitism. It's, it's also anti-Americanism. The same people who attacked Israel, Hamas, which is the terror group designated by the United States government and kept on that list by Democrats and Republican administrations, they share an ideology with Al-Qaeda. They do. It's indisputable. The same group of people who flew planes into the World Trade Center and killed 3,000 Americans, many of them New Yorkers. One, I don't even know if it's a generation later, 20 years later, we have young people in the state of New York who, who feel akin in sympathy and are standing shoulder to shoulder with a terror organization. Now you think about that. It makes me physically sick. I took an oath to fight people like Hamas. And that oath didn't end when I got elected to the New York State Senate. And I take that very seriously. 
And when I see these, these folks standing up, starting from the river to the sea, and, and these groups on college campuses funded by, by New York taxpayers, that's my favorite part about this. They sit on billions of dollars of endowments, and they have the goal to come here hat in hand every year looking for more money so they can hire more professors who can bring on cop killers like SUNY Brockport did on their campus a couple years ago. Why was he invited to speak? Because he was a cop killer. The man had no other reason to be on a college campus speaking. He served time in jail for killing a police officer. A professor thought that was reason enough to bring him to her classroom. I had another university that decided that the graduation ceremony that had been held for years for police officers was no longer welcome on their campus. So they kicked him out. And now I see college kids and professors talking about how exhilarating it was on October 7th. Cornell professor. We have a cancer and a sickness on college campuses. And we need to root it out. We need to shut it off. They want to hire people like this? They want to feed our kids this nonsense? You go right ahead. Draw from your endowment. Don't you dare come to the New York taxpayer and ask them to fund anti-Semitic, anti-American, hateful professors on our college campus. That is this conference's position. They can go in the street and beg for their money before I will give another dime to, to colleges who employ these kinds of individuals. And that is what our conference is going to be fighting for as we move into this session.